go. All right, can you hear me? Yep. All right, and can you see my screen? Yep. All right, great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining the uh, third session here on the supporting men or men supporting the Me Too piece. Uh, this presentation is gonna talk, uh, kind of continue on with some real practical and uh, steps that we've been taking here in, in Iowa and around the Midwest uh, as it relates to engaging men and boys um, and, and women and girls, obviously, uh, around the prevention piece. And lead, so I've entitled this called Leading to Prevent, Igniting a, a Movement, which is, which I like because it has team embedded within that. So um, well, let's get started. Uh, I, here at the University of Northern Iowa, the center uh, really has a mission to, to serve preschool or pre-K through 12 schools, colleges, universities, and also the community partners who work in providing programming around prevention of bullying and gender-based violence. Um, so we're, we're working with students, adults who work with students, um, community partners and agencies to serve youth and families, and we've been doing this um, really intentionally since 2011. Um, but, but prior to that, 10 years before that, it was when I was introduced to this idea, this notion of uh, really creating a critical mass of, of community partners and school folks around prevention, particularly around gender-based violence. And so it's just, um, it, it worked out such that I was able to connect with some university colleagues and we've been working collaboratively together uh, uh, since 2011. And my, our goal uh, here at the center is to touch every school district um, in the state of Iowa and all the agencies and, and a, uh, uh, community partners who work with students and, and families who, who attend those particular schools. And so we've been diligently chipping away um, at building capacity around having these conversations and using a, a very specific, uh, at least two different models to have those conversations. Um, but we're working on continuing to get to all uh, community colleges, helping, helping those um, uh, post-secondary uh, colleagues of ours um, put in really uh, you know, in intentional systemic prevention programming uh, with, with first year students, but also how do you have those conversations throughout the, uh, the academic year. Um, 20 out of 38 private colleges in Iowa, uh, 40 high schools in Iowa currently, and that number continues to grow. And then also working collaboratively with our, our uh, region's sister schools, Iowa State and University of, of Iowa. We utilize uh, um, two, two model programs, one MVP and one Coaching Boys to Men. And just to follow up with Chuck's presentation, um, we're also guided by the spectrum of prevention in terms of how we are connecting uh, and, and, and how we're, the, the conversations that we're having with uh, leaders and decision makers um, within schools and broader community. And also we couldn't do this work without partnering with um, our various partners. Um, we work locally on our campus here with the Sigma Phi Epsilon, but we're also now connected to them nationally. So we're trying to find, uh, again, additional ways to connect with some of their programming. Uh, that could be replicated. Um, what we're doing here on campus with fraternities, having that uh, take place uh, in other chapters across the state. MVP strategies, which I'll talk about more later. Um, take a page out of Chuck's book. He inspired us to also work um, in intentionally with our um, high school athletic association. And so we have been really um, looking at some, some ways to replicate and to uh, practice some of the things that Chuck shared earlier um, around the coaching for change model. The Iowa Department of Public Health has been a, a supporter and a funder of our programming, um, as has Verizon here um, on our campus. And so I have come at this as a from educational lens. My background is in, in, in public education and several years in secondary schools as a teacher, school counselor, and a high school principal. And when we look at the 10,000 foot view of how, how we shape discussions and activities around prevention, whether it being bullying and or, or gender-based violence prevention, what we, what we know is that there's a huge gap. There's a, there's a huge um, opening of opportunities within the secondary school age range. While, while we're fortunate to have programs, national programs like Safe Dates that have a, a wide appeal and certainly uh, is adopted by many of our DV and the sexual silent um, advocate partners, um, we know that there needs to be um, continue to be uh, more programming and being, more programs being developed, which which they are. Um, but when they when, when students um, in the U.S. Or, or in Iowa head off to uh, any type of post secondary school, they're going to be they're going to be challenged uh, and to be asked to think about 
uh, sexual assault. Um, we're going to be asked to think about um, what resources, how do I access resources on our campus, um, and also going to be asked to dis discuss what's your role and responsibility being a student on this on this campus, whether I live on campus or commute. You know, what's my responsibility to providing a safe and supportive campus for all students? So, uh, this this has helped help us kind of pinpoint some of our target age areas. And from for uh, the center here, we spend probably 80% of our time working specifically in the secondary and also the um, higher education realm. Again, community colleges, two-year and four-year schools in our in our uh, in our uh, reach. In 2014, we, we really wanted to again target this uh, secondary school population. We we wanted some feedback from parents, and when we asked them in terms of attitudes about emphasizing certain certain. Uh, topics and initiatives um, loud and clear the parents um, in a sample of uh, almost 700 parents um, of, of uh, who had children in the middle school and high school age shared uh, in, in our survey that um, you know uh, two-thirds plus two-thirds uh, of our parents really really would, were hoping and, and really wanting to see some more emphasis placed um, on dating violence, sexual violence, bullying, harassment of girls. Uh, so this was really helpful for us when I talk to, when I go in and meet with superintendents or other school and community leaders, and, and we start going down the path where, um, Alan, this sounds great, but I'm not quite sure our parents would approve of this. Um, I, I, I share this document with them to say, actually, uh, parents of kids who are middle school and high school, um, they're concerned, and some of them are quite frankly, are, uh, they're scared. <laughs> they're, they're, they're very anxious about um, some of the potential uh, pitfalls and challenges that their youngsters are going to experience. And what we, as being responsible, school and community leaders what we can do to acknowledge those concerns but what can we put in place to um, you know address some of the skills and knowledge around those areas and so i as a school as a high school principal i was encouraged and and, and it was introduced to, to the work of jackson cats in 2001 and we began a, a long process of implementing over time this particular model MVP model, which has as its four core kind of emphasis areas about raising awareness about the issues of gender-based violence, challenging those think, uh, challenging the thinking in, uh, of individuals, which goes into some of the cognitive behavioral theory that we talked about on the last webinar about how you uh, the theory of change and what I think, what I believe, and how I act and behave. Um, we try to do this by creating an open dialogue, a conversation. How do you how do you have conversations um, with individuals about what they think and believe? Uh, getting away from the the, the the texting, the social media, and, and really kind of old school, going back face to face, having a conversation, looking through each other's eyes, and, and talking about these these important issues that um, are really uh, sometimes challenging to 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 have. And then inspire leadership. We want to inspire others to uh, see the inequity, see the, the inequality uh, amongst within gender and start to think about themselves. What can I do specifically? So I have one slide here just in terms of some background for those of you who aren't familiar with the MVP model. Uh, 1993, of the social justice framework, Jackson Katz and his colleagues, Northeastern University in Boston, um, really getting in that peer culture. Um, peer to peer, and I'll talk more about that later. But we discuss the dynamics of gender and the gender inequality, and we uh, take a page out of Paul Kibble's work back in the Oakland Men's Project back in the '80s with the the, the box activity, which is now, um, you know, a, a, a lot of programs uh, who work with both with men or all gender identities, you know, talk about the, the box activity. Um, we certainly incorporate that discussion because it gives us a sense of understanding some of the the foundations with regards to to um, to violence and abuse. Um, it's a leadership model, and now uh, MVP strategies is is what um, is underneath uh, is what Jackson uh, is now operating from, um, which is a distinction between the MVP um, strategies and also MVP at Northeastern University. Um, so components, um, you're going to find most of the components uh, today of a gender-based violence prevention model and also the activities to be somewhat consistent across um, programs who that are designed for this. So for example, the box activities like I mentioned, but that, that way in which we help support open dialogue and discussion and challenging thinking is through activities like agree and share disagree where we'll, we'll post a statement 
um, vagueness, a vague statement um, regarding uh, attitudes and behaviors towards genders or um, sexual assault or harassment, and we'll ask folks to agree or uh, disagree with that statement, and then we'll talk about why and have that conversation. Um, we looked. It's a scenario-based. It's a scenario-based model. Um, we're, we're we're breaking it down. We're looking at facilitation questions that we ask individuals to ask them what they think, what they believe. Why would someone be quiet? Why would someone be silent? Um, what if no one? No, what if no one steps up? What if no one steps into this the situation to help you know, de-escalate or challenge behaviors? What are some of the potential outcomes? Um, that starts to touch on empathy, which is an important piece. We also um, try to link social media skills. There's so many awesome. PSAs that are out there that we can use as uh, discussion starters or opening, um, uh, you, you know, um, icebreaker activities to kind of get the conversation going. But as you can see on the right hand side here, that the the topics um, very similar to some of the issues that Chuck was just mentioning, and having these conversations with 13 and 14 year old students is really important in terms, and it really is primary prevention because a lot of our youngsters that age haven't not have, have not been to part had parties. Or have not been um, have not been drunk, or not have um, you know have haven't even been sexually active themselves. But we're talking about these things hopefully up front before the majority of them ever experience those uh, situations. So we again target target very specific topics, and then we dive in through a, a discussion. So how does this look? What, what do we do? Our strategy, my strategy here is being a former high school principal. Um, and working in communities and, and with uh, partners is we, we, we do a two-day training with adults. We, we, we try to identify in every community about 25 to 35 uh, leaders from across the, the, the spectrum in that community, school, community-based leaders. We'll train them up so that they get to the, um, learn the model, the understanding of the prevention language, um, so that they can then be supportive and be spokespersons for this initiative about how can we be more, more preventative in our work, in our schools, in our businesses, in our families, and relationships. Once that training has taken place, then we identify within the school, in those high schools primarily, we identify between 40 and 100 students to become mentors, to become trained to facilitate this, mo this model. Because that's who we have been. What distinguishes our approach here, I think, um, from other programs is once we train the adults, that's just the first layer. But the real magic happens when we train these 17 and 18 year old juniors and seniors in high schools to facilitate this model to their 13 to 14 year old peers. We do that through an advisory period, about 30 minutes a week, which, 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 uh, takes about um, point, one half of 1% of instructional time during the course of an academic year. So today, uh, we, in 2011, we had uh, seven schools that we were working with in Iowa. 2018, we're at 40 high schools. We've had over 1,800 student mentors trained and we've reached over 26,000 students in this model, having these conversations ongoing. How we do this? Um, we do this the old-fashioned way. We, 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 we put um, older students with um, the, a, a new group of mentors, and so we have students that have been trained by adults who were trained. These students are training and modeling for their peers. They practice facilitation with each other before they actually then go into a group. We do some role play. This is our page right out of the street harassment uh, scenario within the MVP model. So we, we, we role play, we, we try to, to make this as realistic and as engaging as possible, but then we'll break it down and talk about what are the ways in which we can show up to challenge our friends, you know, our buddies from saying things that are sexually inappropriate, um, making a, a degrading comment about a, a young woman's body or physique, et cetera. And so we, we talk about it, break it down, and let's talk about specific things that we can do to show up we practice this stuff um, within small groups so that we start to teach young men that it, uh, it's important that we are able to talk about these things and that we can talk about it in a setting that's safe, but also that we can hold each other accountable. And so having young men talk about these um, particular strategies and approaches on these specific issues, sexual harassment, um, alcohol and consent, um, some of them for the very first time, but we'll practice before they, we'll practice with each other as, before we go into a younger peer. Um, doing things in groups has helped us help build that capacity, um, particularly with young men. Um, as we know from previous conversations that men really do desire and need permission from other men. And so when we have older male peers, older students um, who have been MVP mentors, training the next year's group of mentors as young men, um, it, it, it makes this to become a part of a social norm in our, on our high school campuses and within our communities that says, 
Um, yeah, yeah, men and boys talk about these things, and it's, it's natural to do, or it should be natural to do so. And here's the, here's the framework that we're going to, um, to uh, address these in. And then, and then this particular uh, picture shows the, the associate director of the Iowa High School Athletic Association talking about the connections between leadership and being an active bystander and showing respect for women and girls, and, and how do we show up um, on our, in our uh, high school campuses, and how can athletics um, support those initiatives that we're trying to um, initiate here. So just winding down here, just um, kind of how this spectrum of prevention comes to life for us at the very bottom of this uh, spectrum is this whole idea about strengthening students' knowledge and skills. That's the most important thing. That, that's for us, that's where the rubber meets the road. And so if we, can, if we can educate and train the next generation of youngsters before they leave us, the, our, leave our high schools and go off to military, uh, higher education, w directly to work, um, they're leaving with some skills and knowledge that they, they would not have had had they not been involved in a, a model like MVP or others like it. Um, how has this changed our uh, training? Uh, we go in and provide training for staff and adults, uh, get in front of faculty meetings. So I work really collaboratively with the principals, um, the, uh, the teachers associations and, and uh, uh, PTO, so parent teacher organizations as well. Um, we've modified schedules so um, high schools um, can kind of reserve some time, advisory time, a homeroom time for these, for these uh, sessions to take place during the school day and certainly during orientation exercises as the new group of freshmen students come into a high school. These mentors are right there to help facilitate these conversations, um, be welcoming and supportive um, and get to, and, and to build some relationships. We partner closely with our domestic violence and sexual assault agencies. Um, in, some, in some of the communities, they, our school folks have never met have never met these individuals uh, in some agencies and some parts of the state uh, some of our sexual violence prevention educators have a hard time getting in to the schools to work with um, teachers and instructors around um, practicing uh, around safe dates healthy relationships um, STDs etc so we, we we see ourselves here at the centers also being able to collaborate and, and build some partnerships and then also to um, challenging schools to look at their own policies as it relates to sexual harassment and or workplace bullying, for example. A um, couple slides here on so how do we measure, how we, what are some of the outcomes that, that we've been able to, dis, to uh, discern um, over the last few years is that what we really want to establish are norms within a school and a community that doing nothing, it, while it is an option, it's the least likely option to occur. And so what we know is that students that go through our programs when we assess them in the fall and then again in the spring is that fewer students are content with doing nothing. And so those numbers who, who, who um, would, would actually do nothing about a situation like described here, um, it becomes less and less. And that's exactly what we're trying to, to demonstrate. When it's it comes- to see about time, Alan, just heads up. Yep, thank you, Thanks. yep, you bet. Um, and so again, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to monitor and the trends uh, for positive uh, students who believe these behaviors are wrong it increases over time and that they'll take action. And last slide, the, the last slide here is a, and a big one with, with, with social norms is that sense of responsibility. And what we were able to show um, our constituents, our stakeholders is that after these programs, after the school year, uh, having gone through these, these sessions facilitated by older peers, the sense of responsibility is heightened. Um, it's, in, it's being encouraged and supported. So um, those, are, uh, those are positive norms for us to, 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 uh, to measure and then also to communicate back out to our constituents. So thank you. Awesome, thanks Alan, that was great. Super appreciate it. So again, if folks wanna type a question into the chat box, if you have it, we just have a couple minutes uh, before Henrik starts. Uh, so type it in the chat box or on the participants bar on the bottom, you should have an option to raise your hand via Zoom, or feel free to just unmute and chime in. So we see in the chat box, where is MVP training available? Any ideas, Alan? Sure, we, um, uh, Jackson holds a couple of trainings each year. You can get on that website. I just, um, I just took it off, but you can get on the mvpstrategies.com website and, um, um, there'll be posted postings there that he might be advertising. Here in Iowa, we host two um, train the trainers every year, one in September and one in um, in February. And if folks want more information about that, um, they can they can email uh, me here. Awesome, thanks. And then Laxman, I see your hand is up. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, go for it. 
Yeah, thanks, uh, Alan. Hello. Amazing. Um, hi. Uh, so I just have a few questions with regards to the response from the parent side. Have you, you know, you said you discussed with the PTA as well, but I was wondering if what has been the response from the parent side, especially from fathers who generally tend to come from the sense that my son needs to be strong, bold, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, so and and uh, what I've observed in the school of my child here is majority of the PTA are mothers. Uh, how much of fathers do come in this PTAs and what mm -hmm. their responses have been? Yeah, with this. great, great question. Uh, about 72% of our respondents, Laxman, were um, identify themselves as moms in that survey of the 700. About 72% were, were, were women or moms themselves. So, um, to answer your question, we, in terms of uh, when we, especially when we talk about the, the gender box and challenging those social norms around what it means to be a man and a, a boy, we, we know going, we talk about this. We, we know that, that and, and I used to use personal stories, how, you know, the, the, the role models in my life as a, as a man when I was their age and how that, how those expectations are passed down from generation to generation, that we say up front to our students that we, we know that this may be, this may be contrary or it may be, um, uh, uh, um, mm -hmm. dissimilar, dissimilar to some of the, the uh, challenges or some of the, the things, the ways in which you've been modeled to how to act and behave. And without demonizing those, those, um, some traditional role models, our, our focus is to expand, expand that. And then when we get to the box activity, talk about, um, where do we get, where can, where can these gender stereotypes, where can they get men into trouble? How, how, how do they actually manifest themselves into ways that are um, detrimental and unhealthy? And so, you know, drinking a lot, driving fast, you know, um, having, um, being a player, having, having, uh, you know, feeling that you have to um, sleep with so many women to be young girls or to be recognized as, you know, the man. Um, we talk about some of those consequences, both uh, social, emotional, and physical. Uh, and so uh, we, but we know going into those conversations that we may be saying things very contrary to what's been modeled for them. And, um, but, but no different than when we talk about alcohol and drug prevention. Um, we know that kids can go home to an alcoholic parent, right? And we're talking about, um, staying away from drugs and alcohol. So we, right. we kind of connect the dots there. Awesome. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate that.